Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us here in Copenhagen, and thank you for joining us online. We have a great conversation this morning on whether or not the free world is still in the lead in technology. I'm going to kick this off right away, Alex, by asking you a question. This year, an odd year in both Ukraine as well as in the world of global technology and the rapid development of artificial intelligence. Can you give us your sense, a uh, few reflections on Ukraine, deployment of AI, how that's impacting the global tech race? Well, happy to be here. Uh, I always like being in Copenhagen. It's a great place. Um, and uh, we have a, been in, uh, in Copenhagen and in this country for a long time. It's, uh, some of our stuff is well known, some of it's less well known. It's a high integrity uh, place. But in any case, um, so there's been a lot of discussions around large language models, which is kind of seeping into the broader discussion as uh, AI. Uh, and then, but in less discussion around what arguably was the most important uh, event uh, in AI uh, ever, which was that um, the uh, Ukrainians use technology, uh, it, broadly speaking, to identify targets uh, w using algorithms that are trained over a very large country. Uh, and obviously, the determinant variable in Ukraine was and is their heroism and their technical acuity. But um, one of the big issues in software, so we've been at this for 20 years, was you know, we started, people thought software was largely a fraud. Then we changed the course of especially European history by uh, making it possible to stop terrorism in accordance with democratic norms. Uh, but still, really, until I think um, recently, no one saw really important events shifting. And then you have the large language models now, the large, so if you just collapse them, because I don't want to take up, you know, we, uh, there's probably a lot to say here, but the, the, the combination of AI on the battlefield and the commercial use of large language models, large language models are um, both very valuable, but they're, you know, they kind of hallucinate sometimes, they don't do math well, uh, there's no memory function, and they can't tell you how they got to their, uh, their, their conclusion. Um, but they wielded correctly uh, can change businesses and will change the battlefield. Um, and um, these things are largely produced in, in America. So that's just like a weird fact. You know, we have a lot of crazy stuff going on in America. You may not be aware of it, but <laughs> it's true. Um, but, and at the same time, or maybe because of it, and Americans don't appreciate this, um, you have this country which is producing just where the, the tech landscape has shifted dramatically in the last year. And it shifted because of um, software developments. Um, and, and then so, you know, America's primary adversary, which is mainland China uh, and Russia are, are, you know, there's a tendency to underestimate our adversary. I, constantly yelling at people at home that that's really not smart. Um, but, you know, it is just currently, you know, and this is then the, how do you work with this with Western allies that also have a tech scene? But yeah, America, America's ability to produce AI, both categories and its use is just, and then what's gonna happen in um, the, the commercial side, which is less relevant for all of us here is, um, America's economy, it, it, the, there's a lot of fraud still in the AI market and a lot of the things, a lot of it, and also a lot of unhappy people because they have nothing to sell. But the pro people who can produce and make these algorithms, whether they're large language models or algorithms work, are just going to do very well. And you're going to see the U.S. economy adapt to this and adopt this very, very quickly. So there's just, there's a big structural shift that's happening that will affect the world politically because the economic disjunction here. The short version is 
uh, these large language models make people who are winning much stronger and people who, and there's a, there's a whole economic element, which is why maybe in Denmark, I'm sure in Denmark I'd be voting for you, but in, a, in America, I'm still on the left, which is probably in America, you're, you're, you're far, far, far left. But, uh, you know, well, we both believe poor people should have teeth and, uh, you know, that, that's a luxury item. Uh, um, and, uh, um, but it really will exacerbate people with strong ability to adopt tech and talk, strong enterprises are just gonna lurch forward enterprises, governments, and those that are resistant, parochial, only wanna buy these things from their buddy, their friend, their own country, are really gonna suffer. Thank you. Anders, uh, you've spoken about the need for a technological alliance of democracies. I encourage everyone to listen to the podcast you joined Jean Meserve on called NatSec Tech. It's really very good. And in it, you talk about this alliance of democracy, technological alliance of democracies. I'm wondering if you can preview the podcast. Tell us a little bit now about your thoughts on a technological alliance of democracies. Yeah. Uh Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank uh, Mr. Kapp for his uh, courage uh, when it comes to uh, combining technology and uh, the defense and also the promotion of freedom and democracy, including your recent uh, travel to, to Kiev as one of the first CEOs to do so. I, I really uh, commend you for that. Um, as you know, I rarely agree with President Putin. But actually, I found one statement to which I fully agree. Uh, Putin once said, um, whoever becomes the leader in the artificial intelligence sphere will become the leader of the world. I fully agree. Um, so, it's crucial to discuss who is actually leading uh, the world when it comes to artificial intelligence and other emerging uh, technologies. Uh, the brief answer, I, I still think the West or democracies are in the lead, but we are severely challenged and it's of utmost importance that we are winning the technological race. For instance, artificial intelligence can be used to make our daily life much easier, much more comfortable. We all know that. But artificial intelligence can also be used uh, to um, control your people, to suppress uh, your, your people. So we have to make sure that the world's democracies are setting the global norms are standard for the use, not only of artificial intelligence, but all new and emerging uh, technologies. So it's about winning the tech race. Uh, and um, to that end, we need to build a technological alliance of democracies, uh, a body of uh, like-minded allies and partners to develop um, and implement a coordinated uh, strategy. Um, it could be the US, the EU, NATO, D7, uh, OECD, uh, the Asian Security Corporation, the Quad, just to mention some of the, the frameworks that count members that are like-minded and who could join forces to set the international norms and standards for the use of um, uh, new technologies. Uh, the purpose should be, be to promote the values of uh, free and, uh, and open, uh, open societies. And in more concrete terms, to promote the design, the development, 
um, and uh, the use of emerging technologies according to democratic uh, norms and, and values. It could be to coordinate <coughs> uh, policies and investments to counter uh, the malign use of these uh, technologies by authoritarian regimes and even more specifically it could be to provide uh, competitive alternatives to counter the adoption of digital infrastructure um, made uh, in, in China. Yeah. So that should be the organizational framework and the purpose of a technological alliance of democracies. It sounds like from both of you, uh, we're seeing a cleavage between the free world and authoritarian regimes when it comes to existing as well as emerging technologies. The one country we want to make sure that we include on the free world side as well as Taiwan, as we've all seen how vital Taiwanese technology has been in helping us through the COVID pandemic. But can democracies and the free world compete with authoritarian regimes who may not have the same legal or ethical One, constraints? Yeah, I, I have a slightly variant view of that. I don't think the issue is, for example, large language models, we have a huge advantage because it, I don't know how you deal, build a large language model with the 50,000 constraints you're going to have to have in Iran, China, and Russia. And in any case, the, the, the innovation is all being done on the west coast of the U.S. The, the, where I'm, a, and I really believe in this kind of frameworks where the, the, the issue I would say we have in the west is, can we stop buying software that doesn't work? Like, we, we just like, we, we have these huge budgets, the, uh, we spend, like every country in the world has a thing to buy software from their own country, great. 1% of your budget, 5% of your budget has to go to software that actually has been proven. And while I, 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 I'm much less worried about China or Russia's ability to outcompete us, I'm much more worried about our ability to buy fraud and things that don't work. And then, and then we're just pretending they work instead of implementing things where we have an advantage. And on the large language models, we have a problem in the West because, and in AI in general, there are only two or three companies in the world that actually have products that work in this area. What do the rest of the companies do? They lie, we have to have a discussion, can't do it, can't work with it, the issues are too complicated, and like you sit there and have technical discussions with them about, well, actually you can do it, this is how you segment the data, these are the norms. By the way, I think Denmark should be in charge of this because I'm always skeptical of the completely objective. I like a country that has a high rule of law but ha has picked a side. <laughs> so I think Denmark should be in charge of this. Um, it shouldn't be America, it shouldn't be other countries. But the primary issue for us is not whether China, and, and we're not even using these technologies for the same place. You know, in America, I have a PG version of this. It's like if you want a cheesesteak on Tuesday and you've told your partner you only have a cheesesteak on Wednesday so that we don't have to talk about the obvious thing that you have a private life that includes things you may not want your kids and your family and everyone knowing. Uh, so, but we're not using these for surveillance. Our problem in the West is we, for example, it, you ha software does not, is not theoretical. It has to, in the military context, we have to start buying software that's been proven on the battlefield. A significant portion of our budget has to go to that. And we have to start, we have to be very honest that everything else may not work. And that doesn't mean people shouldn't have other things. And so when you're, one of the things I like about Denmark being involved in this is if you're gonna have norms, those norms actually have to be applied. And that's our central issue. The, the innovation thing of like, can we outcompete China or Russia? Ask the Chinese and Russians. <laughs> they, that's just, it's like, we, we, we are, we're not outcompeting China and Russia on AI. We, we are the only market right now on large language models. And that's gonna stay that way for a long time. And on, on, on AI on the battlefield, not turn towards surveillance, you can see the results already. But we do have a problem internally in our countries that we have an ecosystem that does not, is not 100% focused on our advantages. It's focused on technologies of the past. And we're not gonna win on those technologies. Like, I'm not against hardware, but the idea that we're any better on hardware than Russia and China is not true. We are better at one thing, 
in, in, institutional enterprise software, especially AI, and we're the best at that. And in business, what you learn is, or what I'm constantly preaching in my crazy company is, I don't want to compete with somebody who, on their battlefield. Let them compete against us on institutional enterprise war software. And that's what we need to do as united countries. And that's going to require a huge shift in every country because, quite frankly, people like norms and like enforcing the norms until they find out that the, their pr local provider can't live up to those norms. And then the norms aren't applied. And those norms are crucial to our civil liberties. They're crucial to the warfighter. They're crucial to proving the software works. And that's that's what we really need to get done very, very quickly, because then we can stop having these irrational discussions about people who are countries that are just not good at this. I mean, like, you know, Russia spends about $65 billion a year on military every year. And they're really, they're, I mean, everyone in Europe knows how good they are at fighting. But like, this is a warrior culture. And look what happens. And this is, this is, this is why, like, we just, we need to reorient very quickly to we are going to, we are going to, when I've said this in America, I got, you know, it's like, can we spend, let's have a 10% of our budget scare our enemy budget. That should be our budget. 10% goes to things that scare the living. I'm told not to curse anymore, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I share, I share your optimism. Um, I think free and open societies, uh, market economy, capitalism, if you uh, would put it that way, um, uh, produce much more innovative skills, entrepreneurship, um, new ideas. Uh, so in that respect, we can easily outcompete uh, the autocrats. However, we should be aware of the fact that, for instance, uh, artificial intelligence can be used by autocrats to control uh, their uh, people, to uh, monitor what is going on, to manipulate. Not just autocrats. It can be used by uh, all of us. Uh, that's right. It's that's uh, right. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I think uh, in a democracy, you have checks and balances to counter it. You have a critical media, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, for Putin and Xi Jinping, it's much easier to use uh, artificial intelligence uh, in in uh, in a bad way. So. Uh, I, I do not believe uh, in, in the theory that we could make a pause or we should stop the development of artificial intelligence, uh, chat, DPT, I don't know what. Uh, that, will only, that will only be to the advantage of, of the bad guys because they will continue irrespective well, of, my, of what we are doing. I, well, my personal view is if they would act in a more rational way, I'd be totally in favor of a pause. I do think these technologies are very dangerous. Uh, and while I think the risks of abuse in the, in the Western countries are much lower, and that's why I'm very pro-West and built a company that's central mission is to be pro-West uh, and endured protests in Silicon Valley and barbed wire and being yelled at by purveyors of carcinogens called the consumer internet every day for like 20 years. Um, but um, these are very dangerous technologies. And if our adversaries were more rational and less violent, I would be in favor of a pause, but they're not. No. Right. And I think that that's where we get to this question about, um, and this is actually a question from the audience came in, um, how do we, as democratic free countries, balance, as you're talking about, the intelligence gathering with privacy and privacy concerns that we take for granted in the free world? Um, how do we balance that in the new technological era with AI and other developments? Maybe Anders, let's start with you. I know we're we're running shorter on time. Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, my point of departure is we have to uh, continue developing all the new technologies. Of course, uh, there are pluses, there are minuses, but we have to focus on the pluses and introduce legislation and mechanisms uh, that uh, promote uh, transparency, accountability, uh, protect uh, privacy, uh, make sure uh, we have a, a positive ethical use of new technologies, and that will require oversight mechanisms and uh, regulations. And we can, I think we can manage that. 
So I'm a technological optimist. But you, the, 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 I agree with this, and there, you should, if you want to know how to do this, print out the Danish legislation. The Danish legislation is very detailed about how data moves, where data moves, how it moves, who sees it, how it disappears, neutral arbiters. But the most important thing about the Danish legislation is it's arbitrated by Danes, because the problem is you can have, you need this legislation and you need someone who's believable, neutral, and pro-West to arbit it. So it's like you can't go for the completely Swiss neutral model because there, you need a, like a NATO ally that's not completely in America. It's not in America. It's not in it, but it, it's clearly anchored because you can have all the standards in the world, and I and, and transparent. The standard, the basic core thing is a transparency. Standards have to be transparent so everyone in the audience could evaluate them. And this is a huge issue for large language models. I guess we're running out of time, but the large language models, you don't have, in a large language model, you don't have a custodial relationship to the data. So you can't prove how the, lot, how the decision was made. And this is, this is a constitutional problem for the West because the way European, American legislation works is you have to see where, how the data was put together and be able to call the data into question. So you have a pr presumption of innocence. Um, but the arbiter of this has to be a neutral party that people believe is neutral because even though you have all these standards, the average citizen's gonna be like, well, CARP says it's transparent. Okay, well, he's made all this money. <laughs> like, no one's gonna, it happens, I'm telling the truth, but th telling the truth and people believe you're telling the truth are two different things. I like the concept of a neutral arbiter who has taken sides, yeah. right? I mean, this is where the free world and democracies come into play. And what we're talking about is uh, it, the use of advanced technology in the free world. Are we still in the lead? And to close it out, maybe sort of a yes, no, uh, I think over the course of the last day, we're hearing an awful lot of yes, but, and with the idea that China is nipping at the heels of the free world, either through the stealing of intellectual property or copying. Uh, Alex, where so are you I, on? Are you we know, it's funny. I, I, am, I think the highest ranked Tai Chi practitioner in the business world. So I appreciate Chinese culture. Chi tai Chi is an internal martial art, which means you focus on your internal instead of external threats. Almost everyone in this debate is yes, but they're catching up. And my version is, yes, we're in the lead. And if we want to stay in the lead, we'll focus on all of our own problems and fix them. Instead, this, we're way over, leaf. look, the AI that's being delivered on the battlefield now was not delivered in reaction. You build these things, you build these things, you build the things. The primary threat to us in the West is us not focusing on the resources we have that are unique and end it large debates about people who are misaligned because they have nothing to sell or because they're, it's vaporware they're selling, or because they don't understand the technology, or people I'm sympathetic with who they don't believe, like a lot of my family believes that, you know, if you just d disarm, the adversary will disarm too and play, play fair. 30% of, I would say, the West believes that. Okay, well, that's just clearly wrong. Yeah. And, you know, that's a religious view. Uh, I like, I, I'm pro-religion. That's your religion, but it's just a religion. And so our, uh, our problem in the West is not, it's not technological, it's organizational. And, and like I, I would say to those people who see this differently, we should just be honest that some part of our society believes that pacifism works in the absence of arms and just treat it as the religion it is. And that's fine, but dialogue's not gonna work. Then we should also be honest about the fact that there's just, you know, we, in the last five years, all the relevant technology for the battlefield has been produced in America. And what does that mean? There's some things that are not particularly, not everyone, not all, everyone in NATO is happy about that. So how are we gonna have standards? How are we gonna have handoffs? How can we have people have local sovereignty so their technology's there, so they understand where the data's going? Like, there's no one in Europe that's gonna sign up for data flows going back to America. So these are real issues. Those are our issues, not China and Russia on this, per se. Very interesting. <laughs> Anders?
Yeah. Yes, no. Very short. I would say yes, but we are challenged. And while I agree we should take care of our own problems and challenges, we shouldn't underestimate Putin and Xi Jinping. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Anders, for this great conversation.